Now, fans, is he right? And former NBA vet turned social media superstar Rex Chapman joins us to talk about his inspiring second act. So get hyped, but, you know, keep it safe there, PLS. The jump starts now. That hurts. That looks like it hurts. I'm not going to lie. That's a, that's a jump right there. <laughs> They're trying to jump. <laughs> Welcome to The Jump. I'm Rachel Nichols alongside the future Hall of Famer Vince Carter, also the yes. host of the Hoop Collective podcast over there, Brian Windhorst, live from the Cobra Dome. Gentlemen, there are a million things to love about John Morant. If you're a basketball fan, but his confidence has to be pretty near the top of the list. Remember back to draft night a couple years ago when it felt like the entire planet was focused on Zion Williamson, labeling him the most intriguing draft pick since LeBron James? Well, it was Ja who declared he thought he could be rookie of the year. And then he went out and did it. Ja is also the guy who, in his first season, trash-talked James Harden, got into a social media argument with Steph Curry. Basically, the dude has no fear. So it was hardly a surprise earlier this week when on a TNT broadcast, Shaquille O'Neal asked Ja where he would rank himself among the league's point guards. You know, a category that includes Steph, Dame Lillard, Luka Doncic, Chris Paul, James Harden, among others. And Ja answered, quote, top five for sure. And by the way, it's one thing for him to say that at all in just his second year in the league. It's another when you consider he said it coming off the Grizzlies' loss to the Knicks, a game in which Jaw scored a grand total of eight points on two for 14 shooting. Honestly, if it was any other player, I think those comments would have drawn a full-scale internet roasting. But with Ja, all anyone wanted to do was see him go try to back his words up. And boy, did he stake his claim at that last night. In a game against Minnesota that was so fun, no one would have complained if it had gone five quarters. Morant and rookie Anthony Edwards went back and forth. They went back. Oh, yeah. And forth. And back again. Yeah, going to just get that in there. Edwards would end up with a career tying 42 points in this game. But even more impressive was how he scored. Just ridiculous efficiency. Going 17 for 22 from the floor, 8 of 9 from 3. He also added 7 assists, 6 rebounds, which put him on a list with KD and LeBron as the only teenagers to ever notch at least 45 and 5 in an NBA game. You know, it's been so fun watching Edwards since the All-Star break. Even his injuries and some internal turmoil have cracked this Wolves season. Edwards has shown a tremendous learning curve and a toughness you just can't teach. He leads all rookies in scoring and with each passing game has shown more and more confidence. Last night, after the Wolves fell into a 13-point hole, it was Edwards who sparked them in the third quarter. It was extremely impressive. Although, guess who was also plenty confident on the other side? Yeah, again, Ja Morant, who last night just kept going. He nailed two step backs in the final three minutes. He then assisted on Desmond Bain's dagger. The Memphis win moved the Grizzlies up to eighth in the West, a spot that, if it sticks, would give them advantageous positioning in the play-in tournament. And Ja himself had 37 points, 10 assists, and an answer to anyone who had mocked his bravado in that interview with Shaq. So is Ja Morant a top five point guard in the NBA? Not by most people's measure, but it's hard not to love that he thinks he is. I do want to switch gears, guys, back to Anthony Edwards, who has been, as I mentioned, just on an absolute tear since the break. Now, Lamella Ball has appeared to be in the pole position for the Rookie of the Year award, even though he missed a chunk of time this season. But I got to ask, the 1998-1999 Rookie of the Year, Vince Carter, <laughs> is Edwards closing the gap on LaMelo here? He absolutely is closing the gap uh, right now. He's playing great basketball. And I said uh, some months ago, I said, yes, LaMelo Ball at that time was the Rookie of the Year, uh, leading in the Rookie of the Year uh, in voting. But if, uh, excuse me, if Edwards continued to play the basketball that he's playing, He's going to make people think a little harder about that, that award. And he's doing that right now, playing great basketball. And like you said, he's extremely confident. He knows what he wants to do, and he knows what he can do on the floor. And it's not just dunking the ball anymore. Eight from nine from three, yeah, he's confident. <laughs> so I would go so far as to say that that was one of the greatest shooting performances I've ever seen last night. He scored 42 points without making a free throw. 
That is just an unheard of number, even for a veteran, much less a rookie, who at times this year has struggled shooting the ball. So he's been extraordinarily impressive. Now, the, the big thing in LaMelo's uh, side on this, and probably why I'm going to vote for him for Rookie of the Year, is that he impacted winning from day one. One of the rarest things a rookie can do is impact winning, and that's why LaMelo is probably getting this. And if you look at the, the lines in the sports books, it's like minus seven or 800 for LaMelo, even now, even after this game last night, and, and that's because it's going to be this way. But his second half, forget about the award. His second half is really getting the Wolves fans excited. Yeah. And they have elected to keep playing. And I, I commend them in a way, although I have to say, it's fascinating what's happened here. You know, they've won six of their last ten games. Part of it's because they're healthy. Part of it's because he's playing so well. Part of it's because their new coach, Chris Finch, has made some moves that have really got them going. But they went from being sort of comfortably in the top three to now they're only a game out of sixth uh, overall. Now, you may say, well... What does that really matter ultimately? Well, for them, if they end up with a top three pick, they keep their pick. I was going to say, I want to clarify it's four when you or said worse, they were in the they top give it three away. versus six overall. You're talking about the draft lottery. You're not talking about the standings. Naturally, yeah. Rachel, but thank you for clarifying. <laughs> so so like right that. now, as we sit here, as we sit here right now, they have a 42% chance of keeping their pick. But as you saw how tight those were, if they win even two more games, they could drop all the way down to 30%. And again, that's 42%. Get a top three pick in this draft that's loaded, add another piece to this team, and potentially hit the ground running next year, or don't get your pick at all. So this has been great, but it's, it's really fascinating in those standings now. Yeah, and look, that pick would convey to Golden State if it does convey, and that is part of the D'Angelo, uh, sorry, the Wiggins and, and D'Angelo Russell deal. Vince, what do you think if you're on this team and you see this kid developing the way he is, again, sticking his nose in there possibly for Rookie of the Year and just getting his confidence, really becoming the kind of player they want him to be, do you as an organization try to kind of slow that roll a little bit so you can keep your draft pick or you just say, so, young man, go? I, I, you know, being a veteran and a player in the locker room, you know, when you have a lot of young guys coming in, I get concerned when you do that because you see where – Edwards is tw tw uh, trending right now, and that's upwards. He's playing great basketball. You don't want to scale him back. You want him to continue, to, to continue to gain his confidence so next year he hits the ground running. Yes, I know you want that spot, but let's say you, for some reason, scale him back and things don't work out next year. You want this team, this Wolves team, to come and play great basketball immediately next year and they can do that by continuing to play yeah in their mind they might not make the playoffs but in you know why not set goals like hey let's get to this point let's play this style of basketball this is how we want to play less next year let's give them a sample size of who we can be next year from the beginning so uh you know it's a slippery slope and i understand the organization side but i just feel like you have to be careful when you have so many young guys uh, on your roster and you're trying to find or let's say trying to find a free agent that you need. Yeah, absolutely. And look, bird in hand, right? I mean, this is a prospect you know you have. You know this is a great elite talent that you have. Let's work on developing him. I host the draft lottery every year. I can tell you since they changed and flattened the lottery odds, there is a surprise all the time, every single year. So you can't just guarantee if we finish here, we're going to get this pick. It doesn't work that way anymore. So yes, Brian, of course, organization and teams are still trying to play the odds. It's not like they're not. But those odds have shifted, and, and I just think it's more valuable to develop the guy you have he's so much fun and brian i am glad you mentioned chris finch too here's a guy who got his job in a way that upset a lot of people around the league and i think probably the timberwolves would do things differently if they could do them over that doesn't mean he's not a good coach and he has been able to right. show with this team he is a good coach why gerson rosas wanted him and what he can do if given a full season i'm looking forward to seeing it next year all right let's move over to the nets because james harden spoke to the media today this is the first time he's talked publicly since his hamstring setback he said he is quote very confident he will return before the end of the regular season here's more from james for me just at this point in my career i think you know going into postseasons Basically, since I've you know been in Houston and whatnot, I've been playing heavy minutes, heavy minutes, you know, whatever, just carrying the load, carrying the load, and this is an opportunity for me to get my body right going into the postseason with, with a clear mind and a clear body of all right, you know, you got 16 games to win, um, and, and that's the ultimate goal. That's you know the reason why you know I came to Brooklyn. 
Brian Harden also said they don't have to worry about the skill part of the equation. You heard that at the top of the show. So do you think, do you agree health is the only thing that can keep the wet nets from winning a title this season? Well, it's really important, obviously, because it's been something that they haven't been able to achieve almost all season. But to me, it's still going to come down to if they can put some defense together, because this is just an absolutely vicious offensive team. I've never seen a team like this offensively. But I think we just saw in their last two games against the Bucks, which right now looks like it could be a second round opponent, you know, they were not able to slow Giannis at all. And, and, and also, uh, Chris Middleton and Drew Holiday gave them problems. And so, you know, I, I know that in the regular season, this year in the NBA especially, it's just been, I am going to outscore you. But historically, the playoffs, you have to play some level of defense. And the, the Nets are better on defense than a lot of people, including me, thought they would be when they put this team together. But the cohesion that they've lacked in, in, uh, in playing and getting reps together to get some defensive chemistry, I think, is going to come right down to it along with health. Because at some point, I promise you, they're going to have to get a few stops to win a big playoff game. Absolutely. Health is number one to me. And I think if you're healthy, then you can kind of fix those things. I mean, you have veteran guys. It's not like you're waiting for a bunch of young young guys with inexperience uh, in the playoffs to teach them defense. Yes, you want them to play team defense. Maybe not individual defense will come about, but team defense. But if your guys aren't healthy, you might not get that maximum effort on the defensive end. Because we know you <laughs> offensively, you're always going to give maximum effort. That's just the way it works. But defensively uh, is what you want. So if these guys are healthy, you can kind of go to these veterans and say, hey, you want those 16 games that you just said? It only takes 16. Like you said, Brian, you're going to have to get a stop. And look, we've looked over six months. That's our sample so far with this Nets team. I guess a little bit less since James wasn't there right at the beginning of the season. They've only had six and a half games where their players have all been out on the court together. Now, for the two and a half months of the playoffs, is that going to change? Are we going to get all three for a consistent period of time? That, to me, is the only question. And, and whether it falls this way or that way on whether their guys are healthy would make a huge difference in what I would predict for them going forward. But we'll just have to see. That is, in a lot of cases, luck. All right, coming up, guys. Put that on the highlight reel. That's what you call a dime piece right here. Woo, someone take some fire extinguishers because the Jazz, woo, beat the Spurs last night by 32 points. That was without Mike Conley, without Donovan Mitchell. With that win, they took back the top seed in the West over the Suns, who lost to the Hawks. Vince, do you think Utah will finish out with the top seed? I, I think they can They can do it. They have a favorable schedule. I think they have an easier schedule than what Phoenix does going into the last couple of games. They're playing great basketball, led by that young man right there, Jordan Clarkson. Uh, uh, Clarkson as their closer. Uh, look for them to play. And, and, well, it, it's this question. I think they're doing enough to win. And it, you know, we say don't watch the stats and don't watch the board to see what other teams are doing. But I, I feel like they win a couple of games. The last few games, it doesn't matter to them because they've done enough. You know, what's interesting is that they allow more fans in their building than most other in the league. So their home court is worth, in a way, in a way more than other teams. And, and it's going to get more. So they have, are extra incentivized to do it, Rach. Well, we're going to talk about that coming up. So that was an excellent tease. Brian Winhorst, Make Miss starts in two minutes as well. We'll see you. It is Make Rhythm. Damian Lillard getting healthy again, and he's doing Damian Lillard things. Brian, anyone hit that hard sidestep triple better than Dame? He, when you're a small guy, by NBA standards, you got to figure out how to make space, and the guy's one of the greatest space makers I've ever seen, and good luck trying to defend that guy in space. He's going to get his shot off. It's just whether he's going to make it or not. Ooh. There's only two guys that come to mind. Kyrie Irving uses that move a lot, and then, of course, Steph Curry with the little jazz, little jazzy with, with it as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see Harden do that sometimes, too, but he's as bigger. Well. Doesn't yeah. need to in the same way. You hear what that TikTok is, though? That means it's Dame time. All right, Miss Fatigue. Jason Tatum been feeling really saucy lately. Put about 19 moves on the defender here before hitting the deep two. Brian, were all those really necessary? Yes, Rachel. Of course they were necessary. How else would he get on the jump? Exactly. Great job, Good Jason. Point. It was a 30 Good point game. Point. Show off. <sighs> He had him Show beat off, twice. <laughs> he had him beat twice. <laughs> know, he, he could did. have gotten the same layup two times. You can see here on the on the crossover right right here. He has a layup there. Nah, he has a layup there. <laughs> he said, "I'll take the fadeaway instead." You know, if you've got options, explore all your options. Use, explore I think your it's options. Just I love it. That's Absolutely. What I think.
make taco time. Let's stay in Boston. A little garbage time, but look at Taco Fall picking on Mo Bamba. Vince, that is Nikola Jokic like from Taco. Look at this. Hey, I, I, I enjoy oh. it. I tell you what, with the game like it is today, and some people can say, uh, uh-uh, with the game like it is today, you're seeing five men who are now stretch fives. Right. And they, these bigs do work on their handles. In, in, in practice, believe it or not. They don't get to use it, but when the coach says it's okay, this is what you'll see. Nice. I've seen pivot feet before. That was one <laughs> hell of a pivot foot. Look at the size of that pivot foot. <laughs> yes. Shaq. Shaq yes. couldn't have made a move like that on those feet. Congrats, big man. He, he definitely could not have, Brian. I'm with you on that. Miss <laughs> Settling. Speaking of Jokic, he had four dunks in the first quarter last night against the Knicks. Man. Um, maybe if Nikola Jokic was Taco Fall, nope, is don't. Jokic trying to be Vince Carter? Vince Carter? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, we jump about the same now. <laughs> That's you now. <laughs> oh, did I say that? Sorry. I don't believe that. <laughs> yeah, I I'm like Patrick Beverly. Right. I don't believe I don't that. Believe I that. still think you got him. I'm not going to say it. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Lots of fun. I do want to get to a more serious topic, though, guys. Let's get to the ongoing drama with the Indiana Pacers and their coaching staff. First, we got a Woj report that head coach Nate Bjorkgren's future with the franchise is very uncertain. Now, Woj says the Pacers are suspending assistant coach J- Greg Foster for one one game, finding Goga Bittaze for their heated exchange on the court. Foster was upset with the way Bittaze had not defended in the lane. Bittaze then went down on the other side of the court, yelled an expletive at the bench after he hit a three. Vince, you know Greg Foster. What is your that's reaction the wrong, to this situation? That's the wrong guy to, to, <laughs> to, to yell something to. But, I, I, in, you know, in his defense, every player needs a guy like Greg Foster. He is passionate about the game of basketball. He is old school basketball and he's all about respect. He will respect you and and nonsense. And, you know, young guys can't handle that sometimes, but I feel like every team needs a Greg Foster on their team. Well, Greg is here reacting to it. The players didn't react to it well. Not only Goga, the players didn't like it. And so I, I respect what Vince said about wanting to fire guys up. I don't think that this is the way to go about it. And I think at the end of the day, uh, I don't know Greg like you do, Vince, but my guess is he would agree with you. Yeah, and, and- no, one hundred percent. I'm sorry to cut you off, but I, I agree with you with that. And, and that's that's I said. That's Greg being Greg, and he will he'll be the first to admit. Sometimes he'll go about it the wrong way. But I'm saying, as far as internally in the locker room, uh, that's what he does. He's done. He was our coach in Atlanta, and we had a situation similar to this where. You know, he saved it for the locker room and he got fired up in the locker room. I agree with you with not doing it on the court, and I'm sure he would admit that part. But I I just feel like with guys now and and, and how they are and feel like they come in and they deserve the world from day one, you need a guy like that to kind of bring it back sometimes. Yeah, it is more complicated, though, because, again, we keep hearing Nate Bjorkgren is having trouble because of his relationships with players. I'm not sure how much this helped. It might be like a time and place issue, like you guys are both saying. I want to get to what the jump recommends for today, because this was so much fun. I got to join the All the Smoke podcast with my mm. friend Stephen Jackson and Matt Barnes. It dropped mm. today. Shout out Gina. Here is a sneak peek from that episode. Take a listen. How do you feel of being in the spotlight and being an example for young women that want to be in this space? I hope that I can be a good example when I'm, you know, every day when I'm out there. Along with others like Doris well, Burke and I was others. Say, we're lucky. There's so many women just at ESPN, but even across mm-hmm. the board, that is a relief. And as I say, different from the women who were maybe a generation before me, where a lot of them, they were not the only one in the room sometimes. They were the only woman in the room. All the time, yeah. And now I'm still the only woman in the room sometimes, but mm. it's not all the time. And then Carter, I'm hanging out with Brian Windhorst. It's a good day. Let's talk about the power of Damian Lillard, people, because it is absolute in the state of Oregon. On Tuesday, Dame tweeted in response to Portland not being allowed by local authorities to have any fans in the stands so far this season. He said, quote, so we're going to be the only damn team in the whole league with no fans? To which Jared Dudley replied, definitely not right. When we played Utah, they had like eight, 9,000 in the arena. I bet they get 12, 14K for the playoffs. Can't have that wide a range. I know NBA hands are tied, but there's definitely a competitive advantage, especially since Portland has no fans. Well, guess what? According to the Oregonian, the Blazers will reportedly be now allowed to host 10% of crowd capacity starting on Friday. Dame was asked about it last night. Here is what he said. 
Dame, I uh, just wanted to get your thoughts on, on uh, having fans back in the arena for Friday's game. And I'm curious if you felt like, like your tweet had anything to do with it. <laughs> um, I'm super excited. You know, I, I think our record is, is much better on the road for a reason. You know, we come in these other buildings and just having that, that fan energy, you know, that real energy in the building, it, it feels like a competitive NBA game when the crowd is there. And it's, it's fun. You know, it, it feels... It feels normal, it, it, you know, it's how the, the game is supposed to be played. And then we come home and it's just an empty, dead building. You know, I, it's a it's a noticeable difference. Like you can feel it and, you know, each game that we played at home. And I think um, you can also see it. So I'm excited to, to have our fans back, especially. Brian, you heard Dame refer to it. They are 21 and 13 on the road, but only 500 at home. And look, a lot of this is, as Jared Dudley referred to, it's state regulations. The NBA doesn't decide how many people are in every building. But what was your reaction to Dame's poll there? One tweet, and look what happened. I wonder if Jared Dudley is happy that they're starting it against his Lakers. Maybe you should have asked <laughs> to wait until next week. But, uh, you know, I, I, one of the reasons that the Blazers aren't so good at home is because they're not a great defensive team. However, <laughs> I respect that the guys want energy. And regardless about about whether there's 2,000 fans or 4,000 fans in the, in the building and how it compares in the sound or whatever. It's going to uplift the players. And that energy for the players is what they're looking for. And look, Portland has always been one of the toughest places to play. They've had a, a winning record at home year after year after year, even when they haven't had good teams. So the fact that they have struggled at home, obviously there's something there. And so Dame is probably onto something. And I would watch out, Lakers, on Friday. I was one of the guys that said from the bubble and in the beginning of the season, this is an opportunity for players to lock in to their craft and what they need to do and don't have to worry about the outside interference. Then you think about it a little more after calling a game, not playing, calling the yeah. game in the empty <laughs> building. I'm like, you have to find your own energy. And like, like he said, it's just dead in there. And it's nothing like having fans. And it's nothing like playing uh, in your home building when you're on a run against a very good team. It's nothing like being on the road and they're booing you and talking bad and you go in there and shoot and shoot the, the deep three and go for 42. It's nothing like it. And he said it. It's dead. And we should have it. And it's a disadvantage for us. And now they get that opportunity, especially hosting a Laker team that's coming in the building. And it's tough. There really isn't a great solution here, right? State governments are going to do what they think is best for the health of their citizens. There's different COVID for rates sure. in every state. There's different vaccination rates in every state. I will tell fans of a team that the states that we have seen follow allowing greater fans in the building are often states that have high vaccination rates. So I think that as teams encourage their fans to get vaccinated, that could be something mm -hmm. that could then circle back and have a positive effect on the team as well. All right, guys, let's take a look at today's match moment brought to you by Walt Disney World Resort. The Atlanta Hawks outscoring the Suns 38-15 to in the fourth quarter to run away with that win last night. They've now picked up consecutive wins over the Blazers and Suns. They trailed the Knicks by just a half a game in the four spot in the East. Vince, you did in fact call that game last night. How dangerous are your old Atlanta Hawks? Uh, I tell you what, man, it, it's, it's a proud moment for me. Uh, you know, coming in two, two years ago, yep. we were just trying to build and we're going to make the playoffs. We just have to build for it. And, and to now see everything come to fruition and seeing these young guys develop, seeing Trey Young turn into a unbelievable point guard. We knew he could score. We knew he could pass, but it's just understanding how to play the position. Now, with that being said, the bench. They, hats off to the organization of going to get some scoring, some shooting, and has opened the floor up and made the game easier for their starters. It was a point where the score was four to 16. Four to 16. <laughs> and then, you know, your starters with Trey Young playing 26 minutes only, and the bench went crazy. 74 bench points to Suns 36. That says it all. And if they can play like this, having confidence going into the playoffs, look out because some teams might not want to play the Atlanta Hawks. This is a hell of a roster. They've got talent up and down. When they bring in their second unit at the end of the first quarter, they're bringing like big time dudes off the bench. It's hard to face that kind of onslaught. Uh, and then you got Trey, who's one of the most electric players in the league. And they're still missing DeAndre Hunter, mm -hmm. who's in the process of having a breakout uh, second year. Uh, we'll see if he's able to get back. But um, this is a team that is going to be a tough out in the playoffs. Uh, and I'm just anxious really to see Trey Young because, you know, I don't know how he's such a wizard at drawing these fouls. I don't know how the officials are going to 
let him uh, play in the postseason. But this is a guy who can score 45 at the drop of a hat, and he could be electrifying. And so I, I can't wait to see the Hawks in the postseason. But, Wendy, the beautiful thing about it, I think if he does struggle in the playoffs as far as not getting those calls, the beautiful thing about it is having all the shooting. Uh, you have five guys, if I'm not mistaken, that has playoff experience. But having all of that shooting, if he can get off the ball when he's struggling or it gets double teamed and those guys start to shoot the ball like they did last night, things will progress for Trey and you will see a breakout uh, playoff experience uh, for him instead of a, a rough one like you know, it's possible if he doesn't get those calls. Well, we had Clint Capella on the show yesterday. He's leading the league in rebounds. It just feels like things are finally clicking at the right time for that team. And Vince, I'm going to credit it all to you. I'm just going to say your leadership <laughs> in the locker room, the advice you gave those growing young minds when you were there. I think you're responsible, and we'll just see how hey, far that goes in the postseason. And I understood it takes time for it to all sink in, and yes. it's sinking in. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> when I leave. All right, guys, getting his 36th birthday today. Shout out Chris CP3 only trails John Stockton with the most assists before turning 36. Now Vince you played until the age of 43. How much longer do you expect Chris Paul to play at this level? If he's healthy he could play as long as he wants to. He definitely can play into his 40s. He's very capable. Uh, he takes care of his body uh, and he loves the game and, and he's, he's still scoring so it's up to him. I, I say he's 36. I'd like to see him just play up until uh, 42. <laughs> there we go. Not quite 43. <laughs> Not quite getting your ever. After that last uh, hamstring injury he had in Miami, he changed his habits, went down to work with David Alexander in Florida, has been a different player ever since, extended his career probably. Happy birthday, Chris.